When I first started working for our church, I went to work at the headquarters for the Southeast U.S. Field, which at that time was located next to our local church in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, if you turn right out of the church parking lot and follow Old Hickory Boulevard, a few traffic lights down, you'll find yourself in a place called Madison. It's about four miles east of the church. Madison is now a Nashville suburb of some 40,000 people, but it used to be just a small collection of farms and properties along the Cumberland River. Well, it's been over a century ago now that a steamboat came up the river and stopped there at Madison. Two pioneering Adventist educators walked down the plank and climbed up the riverbank to inspect one of those farms. They hoped to establish an educational institution which would be very different to the established norms, but which would be a spectacle to the world and a model of Christian education. Those two men were supported by an important lady named Ellen White, who was also on the steamboat that day. She looked at that property, run down and neglected as it was, and said, this is God's beautiful farm. And sure enough, Madison College did become a spectacle and a model for education which is still being studied and talked about today. We'll come back again to the story of Madison College, but now to the point of our presentation today. We want to explore the definition of Christian education. Education, as we know, is the process of receiving instruction. It's learning something for some purpose. Now, for the Christian, education is defined by Jesus in His Great Commission, where He said, Go and teach or make disciples of all nations in Matthew 28, 19. Those who will follow Him become His disciples. That is Christian education in a nutshell, directing and teaching people to follow Jesus. But what does it mean to follow Jesus? In order to define Christian education, we need to understand God's intention for us. And so today, let's look at God's plan for education, how it relates to every aspect of our being, and why true Christian education is important for the church today. When Jesus came and He was born here on the earth, He demonstrated God's ideal for every person by the way He lived. Luke chapter 2 tells us in verse 52 that as He grew up, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The Gospel writer here mentions these things because each of them are important. Wisdom is mental development. Stature means physical development, and favor with God and man indicates spiritual development and a focus on serving others. Now, what does God want for the Christian who follows Jesus? 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the apostle prayed for the believers, he was thinking about the well-being of the entire person, spirit, soul, and body. This means that God is interested in our physical, mental, and spiritual development. This is why when He explains what He wants from us, He says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. In the very first paragraph of the book Education, as it introduces the subject of Christian education, we find this definition. Our ideas of education take too narrow and too low a range. There is need of a broader scope, a higher aim. True education means more than the pursuit of a certain course of study. It means more than a preparation for the life that now is. It has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to man. It is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. It prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. This paragraph is so profound that the rest of the book is really just an explanation of these seven sentences. And this has been our definition of education as Adventists for nearly a century and a half. When we think about education, when we plan for education, when we create educational programs, when we provide for the education of our own children as parents, we need to consider the whole person. 
With this definition of education in front of us, how can we be sure that we will have success in our educational endeavors? In Patriarchs and Prophets, we read, He who created man has provided for his development in body and mind and soul. Hence, real success in education depends upon the fidelity with which men carry out the Creator's plan. So if we're going to have success, it will depend on how well we understand and how well we follow God's plan. Let's look a little closer then at how God designed education for each aspect of the person, physical, mental, and spiritual. To look at how God provided for our physical education and development, all we need to do is look at how He arranged the first home. Genesis 2.15 says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. This Garden of Eden was supposed to be the way every person was to live. I know that after sin, Adam and Eve had to leave that garden, but you know, that was never supposed to happen. In fact, their children were supposed to go out and establish other little Edens all over the earth. The book Education comments on this Eden model. The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom. Nature was the lesson book. The Creator Himself was the instructor. And the parents of the human family were the students. Seventh-day Adventists were counseled to provide opportunities for physical labor in their educational institutions. In fact, the first thing they should set up was the garden environment. Notice this from Testimonies, Volume 6. Working the soil is one of the best kinds of employment, calling the muscles into action and resting the mind. Study in agricultural lines should be the A, B, and C of the education given in our schools. This is the very first work that should be entered upon. Our schools should not depend upon imported produce for grain and vegetables and the fruits so essential to health. Our youth need an education in felling trees and tilling the soil, as well as in literary lines. Daily systematic labor should constitute a part of the education of youth. There's something that happens when you learn to work with your hands. The book Education tells us this. Practical work encourages close observation and independent thought. Rightly performed, it tends to develop that practical wisdom which we call common sense. It develops ability to plan and execute, strengthens courage and perseverance, and calls for the exercise of tact and skill. I have heard that you can't teach common sense, but that's not quite true. By giving students the opportunity to work with their hands and solve real-life practical problems, they can actually develop common sense. And this is so important that another testimony comments saying this, If schools had been established upon the plan we have mentioned, there would not now be so many unbalanced minds. This is why Madison College was established on a farm. The first thing they did was to develop industries, which eventually grew to include a vegetable farm, orchards, a dairy, a bakery, a health food factory, and a sanitarium. Students would study in the morning and work in these industries in the afternoon. This meant they were gaining real-world experience and also at the same time working to support their own way through college. In a statement about Madison College written in 1908, the Spirit of Prophecy said, The school at Madison not only educates in a knowledge of the Scriptures, but it gives a practical training that fits the student to go forth as a self-supporting missionary to the field to which he is called. In his student days, he is taught how to build, simply and substantially, how to cultivate the land and care for the injured. This training for medical missionary work is one of the grandest objects for which any school can be established. If many more in other schools were receiving a similar training, we as a people would become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. The message would quickly be carried to every country, and souls now in darkness would be brought to the light. The time is soon coming when God's people, because of persecution, will be scattered in many countries. 
those who have received an all-round education will have the advantage where they are. The Lord reveals divine wisdom in thus leading His people to the training of all their faculties and capabilities for the work of disseminating truth. I find this statement fascinating because it reveals what the missionary of the future will need to be like, and that they're going to need an all-round education, including practical knowledge and physical capability to build and repair things, to grow food, and care for the sick and injured. God's people have been slow to follow all this advice on practical education. It seems like it's too simple, yet too revolutionary for us to trust that this is what God wants us to do. But there's more, because we must develop the mind in Christian education as well. We usually think of God's work for us in spiritual terms, but what He does for our mind is important too. Look at the New Covenant promise in Hebrews 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. What power is in the Word? In Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In recent years, I have discovered what I call the Google problem. Now, I've used several of the early internet search engines, including AltaVista and Yahoo, if you're old enough to remember them, and it was always a struggle to find what you were looking for. But then a little company called Google came along and changed search forever. Here's what they did. They created an algorithm that aims to find what you want and present it to you within the top three search results. So even if there are millions of documents returned by most searches, people started finding what they wanted easily. But now, with such a resource in the palm of your hand, something strange starts happening to your brain. You stop remembering things, and your brain starts expecting that answers will come quickly and easily. But the Bible is not like that. The Bible requires digging, not browsing. Matthew 13, 44 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now, this is talking about surrendering all, but it applies as much to the principle that the truth does not lay on the surface, but is there to be found by those who will study diligently, who will dig for it. Success in life requires a lot of effort toward a constant goal. It requires you not to get distracted by everything that comes along. People's minds today are not as geared for that. And so we need to rescue our minds and the minds of our children by exercising our minds on deep and difficult problems. Bible study requires this kind of focus. It requires us to search, as it says in Isaiah 28 verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. It takes effort, as it says in Romans, there's always more to discover. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. And on this, Christ's Object Lessons comments, saying this, Sharp, clear perceptions of truth will never be the reward of indolence. No earthly blessing can be obtained without earnest, patient, persevering effort. It is essential for old and young not only to read God's Word, but to study it with wholehearted earnestness, praying and searching for truth as for hidden treasure. So Bible study is not just about finding information. As you search for answers, as you wrestle with hard questions, you are rewiring your brain. For messages to young people, we find a couple of statements along this line. The grand subjects upon which the Bible treats the dignified simplicity of its inspired utterances, the elevated themes which it presents to the mind, the light, sharp and clear, from the throne of God, enlightening the understanding, will develop the powers of the mind to an extent that can scarcely be comprehended and never fully explained. That's pages 254 and 255. And it says, The Bible is not just a collection of spiritual teachings, but by deep study 
it enhances our mental ability. The mind will enlarge if it is employed in tracing out the relation of the subjects of the Bible, comparing Scripture with Scripture and spiritual things with spiritual. That's page 262. Down at Madison College, there were no sports fields. There was no entertainment as such. But students had time to study the Bible, to pray, to meditate, and to engage in activities which were beneficial. This prepared them for the responsibilities of real life, wherever life would take them. So just to recap here, we want a Bible-based curriculum, searching the Word, mental discipline, and freedom from the distractions of entertainment. Now, as we nurture the physical and the mental development, there is that third aspect of education to consider, the spiritual nature. Psalm 51, 6 says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. God wants His Word to be such a part of us that it becomes part of our life. Look at this counsel to parents and other educators in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5-7. to seven. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Now as we feast on God's word, what does the Holy Spirit do? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Holy Spirit takes God's word, that, that word that exercises our mind, and the Holy Spirit, through that medium, actually transforms our nature, changes us into the same image as that which we are studying. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students tells us, Many are the benefits derived from feasting on His Word, which is represented by Him as His flesh and blood, His spirit and life. By partaking of this Word, our spiritual strength is increased. We grow in grace and in a knowledge of the truth. Habits of self-control are formed and strengthened. The infirmities of childhood, fretfulness, willfulness, selfishness, hasty words, passionate acts disappear, and in their place are developed the graces of Christian manhood and womanhood. How does the Holy Spirit achieve this through the Word of God? If we look deeper, this statement from the Desire of Ages tells us more. As they feed upon His Word, they find that it is spirit and life. The Word destroys the natural, earthly nature and imparts a new life in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes to the soul as a comforter. By the transforming agency of His grace, the image of God is reproduced in the disciple. He becomes a new creature. So as we study the truth, it has the capacity to transform our nature. And this is what education is about. It is not just about information. It is about an experience. It is about receiving the truth. So the study of the truth is more than just filling your mind with those facts. It's about developing that experience. And Jesus said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the Spirit of Prophecy declares this, The highest education will be that which will teach our children and youth, our teachers and educators, the science of Christianity, that will give them an experimental knowledge of God's ways, impart to them the lessons which Christ gave to His disciples of the paternal character of God. This means both knowing and doing. It's not just information, but having an experimental knowledge, actually doing what we read and experiencing changes in our life. So in order for us to start on this journey, what do we need to be willing to do? John 7:17 7, says, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. If we are willing to obey God, as he said, if any man will do his will, and we surrender to what he reveals to us, then we will really know the truth. Therefore, what is the goal of true education? It must be to know the truth 
and live the truth. The apostle wrote, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. God wants us to be filled with His fullness and to know His love. This means He wants us to become like Him. Quoting from the book Education again, Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for His children. Godliness, Godlikeness, is the goal to be reached. You see, as we develop knowledge of the great truths of the Bible, we come into touch with the eternal. John 17, 3 says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. How do we respond to this knowledge, this knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ? As we get to know Him, something happens, as it says in 1 John 4, 19. We love Him because He first loved us. When we know that God loves us, we love Him back. Does this remind you of the two great commandments? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Love is the principle from which true education draws its basis and motivation. The book Education, again, says, Love, the basis of creation and of redemption, is the basis of true education. The law of love calls for the devotion of body, mind, and soul to the service of God and our fellow men. And this service, while making us a blessing to others, brings the greatest blessing to ourselves. Unselfishness underlies all true development. Through unselfish service, we receive the highest culture of every faculty. More and more fully do we become partakers of the divine nature. We are fitted for heaven, for we receive heaven into our hearts. This is why Jesus taught differently. This is why he was different. He was full of love. He loved to serve people. He loved people. And when we become like that, we are ready for heaven. When we love God and we love to serve others. And this is why the students from Madison College were very different. They went all over the world, establishing missions work, serving the needs of others, growing the church, and all the while supporting themselves in doing it. They were self-supporting workers. So, just to recap, education encompasses physical, mental, and spiritual development. When we learn to love God and how to serve Him with all our powers and all our talents, and we learn to love our fellow human beings, then we are prepared to serve the Lord as He intended, and we're prepared to fulfill that great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. What is lacking the most in today's world? The book Education says, it's the very well-known statement. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. You may recognize this well-known statement, but it continues. But such a character is not the result of accident. It is not due to special favors or endowments of providence. A noble character is the result of self-discipline, of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self for the service of love to God 
and man. And in 1905, the book Ministry of Healing stated this, The world needs today what it needed 1900 years ago, a revelation of Christ. A great work of reform is demanded, and it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual, can be accomplished. You can see here that the world needs a restoration of physical, mental, and spiritual. So people need this work of Christian education to be extended to them as well. And so what are we waiting for? Education says this, with such an army of workers as our youth rightly trained might furnish, how soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior might be carried to the whole world. How soon might the end come, the end of suffering and sorrow and sin. We certainly need an army of youth today. You know what? The youth are longing to do something for God. Now's the time for education to have a greater place in our work as a church. The Spirit of Prophecy says, now is never before we need to understand the true science of education. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. This is quite a serious statement. Even though it was written many years ago, I think it's still true. God's people need to take another look and ask ourselves, do we understand the true science of education? This has to be done before we can fulfill the commission of Jesus. The Spirit of Prophecy says, before we can carry the message of present truth in all its fullness to other countries, we must first break every yoke. We must come into the line of true education, walking in the wisdom of God and not in the wisdom of the world. God calls for messengers who will be true reformers. We must educate, educate, to prepare a people who will understand the message and then give the message to the world. This is our work today. And I'm excited about what God can do when we catch the vision of what is possible when we work in the way that He has asked us to do. One day when I drove down the street where the old Madison College used to be, I noticed a historical marker. It was put there to commemorate the history of the college. And while that plaque is all that's left of the college at Madison, Tennessee, the principles of Madison live on in the hearts of those who choose to understand them. Now, you might want to read the story for yourself. If so, pick up this book, God's Beautiful Farm. And for more on the philosophy of education, take a look at Studies in Christian Education by E.A. Sutherland. He was one of the founders of Madison College. In North America, you can contact Reformation Herald. And in the Pacific, we have both of these in stock here at our bookshop in Sydney. And so, what is Christian education? It is the development of the whole person. It is an experience in spiritual things and in practical things, which enables us to be as useful as possible to the people around us, and most importantly, prepares us to take our place in the heavenly home. And it is my hope that we may personally develop and grow in this type of education, and as a church, make better efforts to provide such an education for our children and our youth. On behalf of the General Conference Education Department, thank you for watching and may God richly bless you.